you very much for giving me another opportunity um, because, as I said at the very beginning, literacy, reading and writing is my job. It's what I love. And uh, my whole life really has been because I wanted children to be able to read um, because it mattered so much to me as a child. And I know how important it is and we've heard a lot of talk about how important it is. Um, so this is a sort of second part, building on what I was talking about this morning, about growing up in a, a society which is very screen-based. Um, and it starts with Socrates, who had a lot, like Ava, to say about happiness and the importance of a philosophical outlook on life. Um, but the other thing about Socrates is that he disapproved of reading. He didn't like it a bit. <laughs> um, he was living at the time when the alphabet had just become a very efficient way of writing down spoken language. And it was just really in Greece at his time taking off that people were beginning to write down their talks and their speeches and their philosophies and to read them aloud instead of what they had done in the past, which would be to declaim, to remember, memorize long speeches, memorize other people's speeches. And um, of course, Socrates' system of teaching was dialogic. He believed in conversation as a way of learning. So when reading began to take off in the Phaedra, he gave three reasons why he thought it was a really bad idea. The first one was he said it is going to play havoc with our memory. We're not going to be able to remember things properly anymore because if you can just write it down, why bother keeping it in your head? Why bother committing it to memory? We are going to lose something so important to human beings, this amazing capacity to remember. The second reason was that, as I say, he believed in dialogue. And he said, how can you have a dialogue with a book? You ask it a question, it cannot answer back. This is not going to work as a teaching device. And his final one was about authenticity. He said, when I am talking with someone, when I'm engaged in a dialogue, I can look them in the face. I can see whether I trust them. I can tell from the way they move their body, the way they look at me, all sorts of things about that person. I can't tell that from something written on a piece of paper. So I, how do I know that the person I'm reading is not lying? It's quite interesting because these are the sorts of questions I'm finding myself asking at the moment about the internet. Um, so it's quite instructive to remember that in Socrates' case these things were sorted out. A lot of it was the problems he was having were actually offset by the incredible access to ideas that literacy brought us. That suddenly, instead of it just being the people you met, or the remembered fragments that could be passed on to you. All this learning could be passed around the human race. So, okay, maybe we lost a bit on the memory stakes, but we won a great deal more in terms of the access to learning. In terms of the dialogue, what happened as time went on, and it did take quite a long time, the improvements to orthography and then eventually the printing press meant that you could read very, very quickly. I think we now engage, we used to talk when I was um, very much involved in the reading uh, uh, world about inter interrogating the text. You can read so fast that you can actually be having an interior dialogue with the writer. Um, I, I remember vividly doing this with Shakespeare as a child, you know, what do you mean by that? And finally sort of getting to what I thought he was trying to explain. Um, but, as we've heard already spoken so well, a shared book is the most amazing opportunity for dialogue around and about the text. 
And I think one of the great things of recent years has been a huge group uh, growth in book groups, mm -hmm. which I must admit I love going to because it's again, it's like the experience of sharing when I was a child listening to my mother read and then when I'm a mother reading to my own child. Just that opportunity to talk about it with other people. And we read so fast now, I think we've got over the problem of not talking. And in terms of authenticity, we, dis we discovered and worked on over the, the centuries the idea of authorship. So that for a book to be printed and published, you actually have to go through quite a lot of peer assessment. Um, it's very difficult these days to get published by um, a, a large scale publisher. Um, and it's got your name on the cover. And that was why when I did Toxic Childhood, every chapter I wrote went back to a scientist to be read carefully because I was frightened that I might have misinterpreted. I wanted to make sure that everything I had said and all my references at the back were as squeaky clean as possible because authorship actually confers a great deal of responsibility. I think over the time then, Socrates' anxieties have been eased a little. Um, but it does very much depend on our huge capacity as human beings to take what we've been given by nature and build on it and learn from it. Um, one of the things we were given by nature, and which is now part of the way our brain is designed to develop, is that huge communicative capacity of language. Um, probably, I don't know, 10,000 years ago, uh, 100,000 years ago that we developed language, and it was only about 10,000 years ago that we first started writing it down, that second great capacity of literacy. Um, we just developed the third. Language was our first level symbolism. Literacy, we started using symbols to write down the symbols. We've now moved into digital technology and we're starting to experience the same worries, I think, that Socrates explain, experienced when literacy began. So, as I said, language is about 100,000 years ago. Beginnings of literacy, 10,000 years ago. But Socrates actually didn't start worrying till around about 2,500 years ago. And we didn't actually get to the stage when the printing press was starting to dispose of those worries until 500 years ago. ICT, I have a great visual aid for you in respect of ICT. I was born in the same year and the same street as the computer. 1948, Manchester, England, the road was called Oxford Road, and I was being born in St. Mary's Hospital on one side, and in the other side, in a huge red brick building, Alan Turing was devising the first modern computer. Now, there were a few Americans who would argue about that, but no, I'm British, and I believe that was the first modern <laughs> computer. Um, so, in fact, we are both um, of an age. This is my latest friend. I call him Del Boy. <laughs> um, we've grown up together, and I have, I have, I, as I said, I have been a, a hopeless enthusiast for the whole enterprise ever since, well, since we were teenagers together. Um, in, in 1967, I think it was, 67, the, um, the very first digital broadcast that went around the world, the entire world on television, was shown, and I'm sitting in my sitting room watching this thing and thinking, we live in a global village. It is unbelievably amazing. A whole load of rather boring politicians came on and made speeches, and then other people made speeches, and then at the end, this broadcast was coming from England, the Beatles sang, All You Need Is Love which struck me as a wonderful finish to a <laughs> programme about the global village. So I grew up watching this stuff. First computers we got in our homes were these Amstrads. I wrote, started to write my books on computers. Um, I have one of the first websites in the world, she said proudly, <laughs> made by a brilliant graduate student. So I'm certainly not suggesting 
that um, there's anything bad about them. But I am suggesting they're very new. And in one lifetime, it's very unlikely that we'll have worked out the sorts of solutions that took 2,400 years to work out for Socrates. <laughs> Which is why I think we need to think about it. I'm going to tell you a story about a little boy. This was one of the things that spurred me on to start. Well, I'd, I'd actually already begun to research toxic childhood, but it certainly spurred me on. I had a very good friend who is also a literacy specialist, and we, he was involved in a storytelling project. He believed very firmly, like Socrates, that it would be good for children to learn some stories by heart because that would help develop their memory, it would develop their capacity for narrative, and they enjoyed it, listening to a story many times and then being able to tell it themselves. So he had a project he was doing in school, and in order to prove that it worked, because we have to have evidence nowadays for everything, he used to go to a school and say to the first year teacher, this was the children of four and five, um, can I have three of your children? Can I have um, one that you think is a high ability child, um, one that you think is middling, and one that you think is struggling? And these three little children would be brought in. Pi would take a microphone and say, could you tell me a story? And he'd put the microphone under each little nose. Um, at the end of the project, all the children could tell stories, which meant it worked. But at the beginning of the project, he said the thing was, it was quite striking. The child who'd been assessed as able could tell a story, more or less. They could come up with a version of Goldilocks or some story that they'd heard repeatedly. Middle and lower ability, he said. Sometimes they sang Bob the Builder. Do you have Bob the Builder? <laughs> Sometimes they'd sing a signature tune from a TV programme. Sometimes, he said, you'd just get a few words. Cinderella, sisters, shoe. Um, there was one little boy, and this one struck me particularly, um, who was a middle ability child. And Pi said, he just kept saying the word fish. Fish. We all sort of looked at him, and then the teacher took him to find out what it was about. The little boy was trying to tell the story of Finding Nemo. It was his favourite story. He watched it every night before he went to sleep. But the thing was, there was not a beloved adult there, was there, who was saying, once upon a time, there was a little fish called Nemo, who had a wonky fin. Early one morning, Nemo's daddy took him to the school, and he met the other little fish. He wasn't getting the narrative, the auditory narrative, that made that story make sense. So, of course, when he's trying to tell it, all he could do was say, fish. That is one of the things that to me is the most important thing about humanity. It starts with play, that's our inborn learning drive, it's intrinsically motivated and it develops those powers of self-regulation. But that play can also be social. And in the early stages, once you've done the making faces and the mother reads, and the, the, the nursery rhymes, it then moves into these. Story and song. Story and song. And to begin with those stories, maybe told, I have to admit, I was brought up by a grandmother who could not read. Um, but she told me stories. And she would tell me the same stories over and over again. And that tuned my ears into those narrative patterns. She also sang me songs, mostly musical songs, old songs that she remembered from her childhood. But that too tuned my ears in, ready for when I wanted to remember sequences of sound. Um, so vital 
that we get from the beginning narrative language patterns. And of course, a parent today who can read the wonderful words of a children's author with all the rhythm and pattern that someone can put in. We've got a, an extra bonus in terms of the stories we give. But we also need this song. I think sometimes these days we've forgotten. It was wonderful to start today with it, those beautiful songs. Oh gosh, that voice was wonderful. Um, you don't need a wonderful voice to sing to a baby. They just want to hear you. Um, and to sing with small children. Um, I've got a very good friend now who's doing a PhD in the connection between music and literacy. And uh, this is one of her um, PowerPoint presentations. And I just, you know, it sums up so wonderfully. There's so many ways in which singing and music helps develop our capacity for reading and writing. All that repetition, that auditory memory that that repetition is developing, the fluency that it, um, what's the word I want? The fluency that it develops, that'll do. Um, it's also hugely pleasurable. It seems to be one of the things that gives most pleasure to human beings. And joining the choir is often a recipe for quite a lot of happiness. Because letting the music come from ourselves and expressing it is... I wish I were good enough singer to join the choir. <laughs> it also, particularly with children, usually results in movement and again, all that opportunity for developing control and coordination. And of course, remember Sally Ward and her discriminating sounds? Music is one of the ways children learn to differentiate and discriminate them. And of course, it's got a huge social function. Again, one of the best ways to bring any group of people together is to sing a known song, as football crowds know only too well. It's also to do with sequencing. And as I'm going to say, one of the major things about uh, the way our language works is the fact that it obviously has a linear sequence. And music, through the repetition, develops the fluency of that sequencing. It helps children pick up more and more vocabulary and language. And in terms of phonics, which is a subject that anyone who does literacy has to be fairly well aware of, there are three levels of phonological awareness that children need if they're going to read. The first is an awareness of syllables, which comes through the rhythm. The second is an awareness of rhymes, which are patterned in music through melody. And the third is an awareness of pitch because most of the vowel phonemes are simply to do with variation of pitch. It helps children learn to listen. It helps children to coordinate their movements with music making and as part of action rhymes. And it also is another introduction to the fact that we use symbolic information because those sounds can be symbolized on paper. And for that, I have to thank my friend Maria Kay. That is her book on the subject. Um, my own interest is much more in that bit. Um, the whole business of adults reading to children or sharing stories with children in the ways that Ava has been talking about and that Jim Tree has talked about before lunch. It is just, if you want them to become readers and writers and to flourish, you need... <laughs> Actually, there's a, the, the little boy who said fish, there's an extra little bit to that story because about three years after um, it had happened, Pai rang me up in a state of high excitement because he'd had an insight. And he said, do you remember I said that the child, the able child, could tell you a story, could always tell you a story? And I said, yes, yes, I remember. He said, I got it the wrong way round. The reason that child was able was that somebody had been telling its stories over and over and over again. Love, play, story, and song. And your child is going to reach, I believe, its full potential. So it's very sad that the tradition of storytelling is no longer as alive as it was. 
this uh, cartoon, Let Me Tell You the Tale of the Evolution of the Bedtime Story, was sent to me by a friend. It starts in 1950 with Mummy, I suppose, telling the story of Little Red Riding Hood, the beloved adult, sharing an emotionally satisfying experience. But of course, by 1975, technology had begun to move in. And I do have to admit that once my daughter got to about 10, and she went to bed a lot later, I found that I was too exhausted to read huge amounts, so we invested in quite a few um, stories on tape. And actually, I found it a huge delight to sit there with her while we both listened to Alan Bennett reading Winnie the Pooh, mm -hmm. or, you know, another really good rendition of a children's book. Um, but of course, we were still getting the narrative, we were still getting the words by 2000. They've gone. It was in 2004 that I recorded that 80% of UK children now had a television in their bedrooms. So they were watching their bedtime story. Now, when I was doing the new edition of Toxic Childhood, um, I discovered actually, to, to begin with, to great delight, that that figure had gone down. Instead of it having gone up, suddenly it was down. And we were down to under 50% of UK children having a television in their bedroom. But of course the reason is that instead they're taking their iPad to bed with them and watching it on that. I've shown this before, but it's one of my favorite slides. It was made for me by a dear friend. And it, it, it's true, we, they still need all those things. We cannot rush them and say, okay, get your story off screen, you know, now because the brain still needs the same experiences it's needing if we're going to help them be able to do this amazing reading thing for themselves. And this amazing reading thing is actually really, really important. So it starts with the oral tradition, whether that oral tradition is told as my granny told it from her memory, or whether it is a book that is read aloud, um, and I have to admit, there are probably people in here, in this hall, who have children with favourite stories, who can now recite those favourite stories completely by heart, because you have read them so many times. Are there? My daughter's favourite story. I was horrified. The story she always asked for, every night, was a really boring story called Postman Pat's Rainy Day. <laughs> Now, I got her glorious children's books with wonderful rhythmic language, you know, famous ones. And why did she want Postman Pat's Rainy Day? Um, I asked regularly, and she said, it's my favourite. <laughs> I have asked her since she is an adult, and she looks at me knowingly, and she says, you really didn't guess? And I said, no. And she said, it was the longest. <laughs> it was the one that would keep mummy there. Or longer. I had to suffer that darn book over and over again. I would have got her another long book if she'd told me. <laughs> um, the point about the, the, the narrative tradition is that it is developing our capacity for linear sequential thought. That was what Socrates thought was so important about the memorization of speeches and explanations, that you are developing this capacity that language by its nature is linear and sequential. But the longer and better our capacity for that, the better able we are to think. It also gives us our capacity for logic and analysis. It is no coincidence that we talk about thinking straight, being able to think in a series of logical steps. So it's through stories that we recognise for the beginning cause and effect. The actions of those characters have consequences. They are real consequences. Uh, and that the understanding that there's a sequence of events and that they actually feed into each other. And once something's happened, it's changed the circumstances in ways that may not be possible to change back. 
But it's also, as well as underpinning analytic capacity for logical analysis in all sorts of symbolic systems, it's also giving these insights which Ava has so ably expressed into the way human beings work and the way human beings can work and can use their minds in a positive way. It gives opportunities to consider moral dilemmas, that battle between good and evil that all children seem instinctively aware of and are playing out through their play day in, day out. And the more stories we've got, the more they're able probably to express and understand that. And I think one of the most important things for me is that it helps children make the pictures inside their heads. It was a thing I remember doing a lot with little children when I was a head teacher. Um, I didn't teach the very small children, I taught the slightly older ones, but if I ever had to take the little ones, I'd usually go down with a, a, um, a poem that I knew would go well. It was a Christina Rossetti poem about a caterpillar that I know always went well. And I'd say, now look, I know Mrs. Bradley always shows you the pictures when she's reading your story, but I haven't got a picture for this one. So I want you to look at that space on the wall over there, and while I'm reading you this little poem, I want you to make the picture in your heads. And they'd sit there, with their little eyes fixed on, this, on the wall, and you could see them trying to create it. And there were only a few children who had been so indoctrinated by the system of watching a telly that they used to stand at the end and say, I didn't get it, when, when's the picture coming? <laughs> You had to do it quite a few times until they got the idea, and then they could start to internally image things. I think we are actually in many ways depriving children of that ability, because we always give them the picture nowadays. Um, it seems to me that mental imagery is a very, very important part of our capacity to think. And I just love this quote, because I think it sums the whole thing up by Kieran Egan, who's a professor of um, literature. We are a storying animal. We make sense of things commonly in story form. Ours is largely a story-shaped world. Stories are tools for organizing our emotions. Which is why I'm a bit worried at the moment. Because I think if children have had play, love, story, and song, by the time they're around about five, six, seven, most of them are ready to start reading. And many of them it will happen very easily. As someone who was sung to and um, told stories from a very early age, I was reading by five without anybody actually having to teach me, which is a very lucky child. Um, and many children that I find in countries where there's a good kindergarten systems will just pick it up because there's just been so many opportunities. Um, but for those Children who don't, around about six or seven is quite early enough, I think, to be asked to get started on it. And then there is, in traditional literacy, an opportunity for a slow, steady build-up of those skills. Now, that business of focusing attention and self-regulating, obviously, this opportunity to build up your capacity to read, which hopefully, because people have inspired you that reading is really great, you're going to want to do, you'll be motivated to do it. Um, and even for the child like myself, who was a, an early reader, the opportunity to practice and gradually build up my skill as a reader, I think builds on the capacity to focus attention and makes it easier for children to focus attention when it's needed and then come up from the page when it's not, directing the focus. The actual decoding and understanding of text, I think, is possibly one of the most difficult things we ever teach our children to do. It is really complex, it's using practically every single bit of brain, all going at once. Um, terrific mental interconnectedness. And as they're getting better and better and better at that, and able to interrogate the text as well in their head, the amount of mental activity is massive. So this slow steady build up, the focusing of attention, the getting of the stories off the page, there are real rewards. And it is, of course, constantly increasing the capacity for sequential linear processing, which is making us cleverer. So let's look at what digital learning can do. And uh, believe me, I think it's very amazing. First, immediate access 
to all sorts of information. Secondly, we can I do it all the time on the computer, I'll dive in from window to window. I'll be able to con make connections between different things. You're continuously giving partial attention to little bits of stuff. We've got access to all these information sources and different ways of using them. And we can get so much hyperlinked information and pull it together. And what this gives us a capacity to do, which we certainly did not have until very, very recently, is making these amazing connections and rapidly, intuitively processing it. You put those two together, that's one heck of a brain we're going to be creating. My problem is, if you put them together too soon, the stuff on the right-hand side is directly counter to the stuff on the left. For me, I want to get that bit in first. <laughs> I want them to have laugh, play, story and song. I want them to get started on reading and be able to read at around about a seven to eight year old level, which they're enough now to get them practicing and doing it more before I want to start pulling the other stuff in. Um, now this is not going down well at the UK at the moment because Everybody's buying iPads for three-year-olds and sticking them into the nursery classes. Every time I hear it, I say, if Steve Jobs would not let his own children have iPads, why is he so content to sell them to the three-year-olds of the rest of the world? <laughs> we are beginning to see more and more problems because these things are happening. Well, I think there is a causal connection, but then that's probably because I do too much reading and I do logical sequential analysis. Um, but there seem to be definitely now some issues arising. And when you said you'd leave it till seven, Ava, if I got the chance, I'd leave it till seven as well. <laughs> but I'm happy to abide by the Academy of Pediatrics because they're the experts, but I really don't want to see this happening. There are plenty of 21st century warriors. I've just mentioned those three. The Shadows was a book that came out in 2010, and I think was, it opened the floodgates an American author who was just looking at the, the quality of our thinking and the quality of our memory when we are working on the internet rather than through the medium of the written word. Susan Greenfield is one of our most eminent neuroscientists in the UK and she's written a number of books on the subject. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a group of people in the UK who are monitoring, and Susan at the head of it, who are monitoring what's going on in terms of ICT and the development of the brain. But her most recent book, Mind Change, compares it to climate change. She thinks it's that significant a shift, and it is one that we should be attending to. And you may know the name Howard Gardner because his theory of multiple intelligences has been a very important one in education for about the last 20 years. He recently did a book about the way the use of apps um, and the use of smartphones and tablets is affecting particularly social existence of American teenagers. And he went into it, he and his um, co-writer assure us with a very open mind that they came out of it rather concerned. I've got to finish by mentioning this book. This was, for me, one of the most significant books I've ever read. Neil Postman was an American academic who wrote basically very long essays. And this one, called The Disappearance of Childhood, which you can obviously see as a title which is of interest to me with my research interests, it actually turns out to be about literacy. Postman's contention is that childhood, as we think of it, is actually a very recent invention. It's to do with literacy. That in the past, until we became a, a much more literate species, children just experienced the adult world like the adults. They were exposed to exactly the same things that were going on in their village. They just knew what happened at home in bed at night because they were sleeping in the same bed. <laughs> they had all sorts of understanding of adult life. Gradually, as we became a more sophisticated, civilized um, race. We also developed literacy. 
And basically, a lot of the adult world was now accessed via the printed page. And childhood, up to the age of about seven, before children could read, became a special protected place. This is Postman's intention. And that idea of childhood has gone on until the 90s. Now, Postman, I think, died at the end of the 1990s. He was actually thinking about what was going to happen as our world became a more screen-based world. And he said that childhood would begin to disappear, which is, in terms of the decline of play at least, in terms of the decline of story and song, I think, with young children, is definitely beginning to happen. But I'm going to finish with one quote that was not from that book. It was said on a radio programme in 1992 or something, it says it at the bottom, sometime in the early 90s. He, um, he was comparing two books, and they're two books that are both particular favourites of mine. I don't know how familiar people are with of these in Czech, Czech Republic. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley is written in the 20s, and it's about a world which is all the pursuit of pleasure, where everyone is kept drugged in order that they feel okay, and no one's allowed to experience frustration because it will spoil the even running of the world. And everything's on a very superficial level. And then the second one is George Orwell's 1984, which is a book about living in a surveillance state, state where Big Brother is watching you, and where everything is ruled on fear. Um, this is a comparison of the two, and I find it quite disturbing at the moment, brings sort of Socratic thoughts to mind. What all will have feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. All will have feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. He said that in 1995. I, I like to point it out to teachers when I read it to them because he didn't read it. He said it off the top of his head. And the reason he could speak so fluently and amazingly was that he'd read so very, very much. And he'd written himself as well. But he also said it, if you think about it, 95, the internet was hardly going. It was only just getting going. The first websites were going. So it was hugely prescient in terms of his thoughts about that. So, I think that all our wonders, our reading and our writing, and now our ICT, are making us cleverer. And I think that it's up to us to make sure that we help our children also to be more and more human, and to have the advantages that humanity brings to the table. And I genuinely believe that we will be able to solve the problems much more quickly than they did for Socrates. Thank you very much indeed. Again.